welcome to this neuroanatomy, neuropsychology, brain lab practical walkthrough um, to talk you through uh, the tasks that are set out in the uh, brain anatomy instructions file that you'll find on the Blackboard site for brain behaviour and cognition. There's also a feedback sheet there with answers or uh, uh, guidance on uh, where all the different brain structures we'll be covering are to be found in the brain. But I'm going to talk you through the basics of how to run MRI CROM uh, software and work through this uh, practical online at your own pace. So the point of this is to get to use MRI CROM uh, software which you can see up and running on the screen here uh, now and this is a uh, MRI scan viewer uh, that's been developed for, for research purposes and it's really useful for actually, actually viewing all sorts of different types of neuroimaging um, uh, file and it's used a lot in research both in terms of functional imaging and analysis of uh, uh, structural lesions in, in patients. So uh, I'll get you going by actually closing MRI Cron because if you log on to any uh, computer at the university you should be able to find from uh, the start menu down here where MRI Cron is. Uh, you may find it in a subfolder, but it should be there. And you start MRI Cron by clicking on that icon, and then something like this will come up. It might be that you see a different image in this uh, window here. A bit like that, for example. Okay. Uh, well, uh, don't worry, it's just somebody's been messing around and opening the wrong file. If you actually open the file that's called ch2.nii.gz, that would be the one that we're starting off with. Um, okay, so all of these files are on a networked drive where you'll find the MRI cron uh, program here. So the first thing we're going to do is get familiar with the uh, controls that you use to view the MRI image. We can expand the uh, uh, window here so we've got a much bigger view. And you see you have three different views of the brain which are based around different uh, slice planes. And there are uh, specific names for these different uh, uh, slice views uh, which are interesting to know. So this is called the coronal uh, view, so we're taking a slice through the head uh, like uh, this. We can move backwards and forwards in the brain along that uh, coronal axis. Uh, this is called the sagittal view, where you're slicing from front to back. Sagittal is from a Latin word meaning an arrow, so you could think of an arrow pointing forwards and backwards straight down the middle of your head. That's easy to remember. And this is the axial or transverse view down the bottom here. Again, we can scroll up and down in the brain like this. MRI cron has buttons up here to allow you to add um, a crosshair so you can see exactly where you are. So as I move up and down on the transverse view, you can see the crosshairs going up and down or uh, backwards and forwards. You can turn that off now. Now we've given you a, a worksheet on uh, Blackboard to, 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 to go through some basic tasks that we're going to do in this uh, practical. And uh, the first one is to familiarize yourself with these controls. Uh, but we're also going to use some drawing tools within MRI Crow to highlight particular structures in the uh, brain. And these are these buttons up here. So you can see uh, this paintbrush with a, uh, a line on it. It allows you to draw on the MRI scan and highlight particular areas. Uh, so I'll demonstrate that now if we click here. Uh, I'll find a structure to highlight. This is one of the ones we'll be covering later. This is the thalamus. And I'll draw around it on the sagittal view here. 
it's a little bit fiddly and you can use that fill tool to uh, blank out the whole area in between. Now if you make a mistake there is a, a way to uh, delete. If we hold down shift we can also use this function to scribble out things that we've done. Okay, So it's a little bit fiddly to use the drawing tool but you'll get used to it. Now let's take a bit of a tour of the brain and explore its basic features and you can see here the wrinkly lines around the edge that are slightly darker color on the axial view. You can see some big dark patches here and some lighter spaces in between the two. Now these gray areas here that you can see as I'm tracing around are the cerebral cortex. And the white areas underneath that gray line are actually where uh, the axons, the connections between particular nerve cells are connecting different areas of the cerebral cortex and uh, connecting the cerebral cortex with input and output to other brain areas, sensory organs, uh, uh, organs controlling movement, muscles, etc. If we go right down to the bottom here, you'll see the eyeballs and we can scroll up through the brain here. We start to see part of the temporal lobes of the cerebral cortex here the frontal cortex, the orbital frontal cortex just above the eyes, scrolling all the way back up. And you'll see as you come back up the brain, there are some other areas of what we call gray matter deep down in the brain embedded within the white matter that you see all around it. And these seem to be separate and discrete from the rest of the cerebral cortex above. And we identify these as subcortical structures is what we call them as opposed to the cortical uh, uh, structures and areas in the cerebral cortex which is the wrinkly crinkly stuff at the top here. So one of the questions in the worksheet is why uh, the white matter is white, why are these connections areas here showing up as they are. Of course you can't see the individual fibres here, they're far too small, but all of those fibres are surrounded by this fatty sheaf of oligodendrocytes and that facilitates conduction of the actual potential signals between uh, neurons. And this type of MRI scan, which is a T1 MRI scan, uh, fatty stuff shows up bright and uh, white and the more fluid or water there is there, the darker it's going to be. So generally the whiter stuff is fat and the um, dark black stuff is uh, fluid. So going up to our instruction sheet, we're now on to the bit where we're going to do some drawing around different uh, brain areas. Now, I actually suggest you spend a bit of time doing this and really uh, try and identify uh, these different brain structures and spend some time drawing them out because what you're really aiming to do is actually create three-dimensional volumes highlighting these areas. Now I've done a few of them um, already so excuse me if we uh, go to uh, uh, open VOI that's volume of interest so we do draw open VOI. So I created some of my own, here's some I did uh, earlier. This is the brainstem area, this is the area that's involved in vegetative homeostatic functions maintaining respiration, heart rate, so nothing that we're really thinking about actively is done in the uh, brainstem here. Um, and I've drawn around that using the drawing tool and filled it in as I showed you with the paint tool there. Um, and we can now not just see it on uh, one slice here, but on 
all of the different slices. We can also change the view with these controls up here, by the way. Might be easier to do it like that. Uh, so I'm going uh, backwards and forwards there in different uh, sagittal planes on the sagittal view there. And you can see the uh, brain stem highlighted in every slice. But if you also look on the uh, axial view as well, we can see it highlighted in this different perspective. And then finally from the coronal slices, it's different again. So I actually drew all of these on the sagittal view, uh, but it lets you see the whole structure in a different perspective over here. So it helps to give you that three-dimensional perspective on the structure. Let me open another one. This one took me ages, which is the, the cerebellum. Okay, so now I've highlighted, I just did one side of the cerebellum and I drew it out over here on the uh, sagittal view. And of course this takes quite a lot of time with all the wrinkly, uh, crinkly bits. But the process of me doing it, I really learned a lot about how the cerebellum is uh, uh, put together. And the cerebellum is essentially uh, involved in skilled automatic control of movement, possibly aspects of cognition as well, but it actually contains uh, almost half the brain cells in the whole uh, nervous system. It's kind of like a spare brain on the back of our, our, our main brain, the cerebral cortex. And it, it, in fact, it's much overlooked in neuroscience and cognitive neuroscience in terms of its importance and actually uh, taking the opportunity to um, highlight the whole of the cerebellum using the drawing tool really makes you think about how important it is and what a complicated uh, structure it is. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is uh, do the same thing, but for the uh, basal ganglia. Um, and I'm gonna put the video probably on fast speed while I do this, because it will take quite a while, um, but uh, it will uh, be a useful exercise as well for you to see me do this in fast motion. I'm going to go to the actual view. I'm going to close the cerebellum BOI. And then I'm going to create a, a, a new one here for the uh, basal ganglia. Which of these areas of dark grey matter you can see uh, buried inside the uh, cerebral cortex. And this front bit here is the chordate, and this is the putamen. But what's going to be interesting to see is how these actually uh, vary, uh, how these sort of build together into a 3D picture when we uh, highlight them using the volume with interest uh, drawing tool and help you understand how they all fit together. I'm going to start from this size, slice here and we'll go into to, to super fast speed now.
just got the top here of the um, putamen that we can see. We're nearly finished tracing out the, the basal ganglia. I'm just going to complete it, do these last few slices. And this is the head of the chordate nucleus here. And this part of the chordate nucleus is sending out connections and receiving connections from the frontal cortex of the brain. So this part of the cordic nucleus is important in, for example, working memory, attention, control. And is integrally connected with the cerebral cortex above via these reciprocal loops or circuits. And those are all running through these white matter uh, tracts. And conditions where the striatum, the function of the striatum is affected include Parkinson's disease, uh, where there's a loss of dopamine in the striatum and the uh, chordate, and that leads to both the motor and the cognitive symptoms associated with Parkinson's, and Huntington's disease as well, where you're actually getting degeneration of the chordate nucleus itself, leading to more profound and rapid uh, cognitive impairment in, uh, in that condition. I'll do a couple more slices. You can see how the chordate nucleus, there, we've gone from the head to the body here. It's called the body of the chordate. And it's going backwards in the brain, following the whole structure through this grey matter region here is still the chordate. And we're going through to what's called the tail of the chordate. Okay, we'll finish it there. Um, now We'll be able to see on the other slice views what we've actually done. This is where it gets interesting. So of course it's sort of bitty like this because we've been tracing it on the actual view. Uh, so when you look at it on the other views it's a bit fragmented but you can see it does sort of help you start to get a 3D picture of these structures and how the axial converts onto these other views. Now what would even help that even more if we use the film tool here just to, to block these out now we've finished drawing them. This won't take long. I'll put it on high speed now. Ah. Okay, so if that happens, just undo. So the reason why that did happen is I hadn't closed that region of interest there. Okay, awesome. So the whole thing's filled in there. Deselect the, the fill tool, otherwise you'll blank out the whole brain again. And um, then you can see your whole volume of interest. And you can follow through the whole structure there of the, the chordate nucleus from the bottom. I've got the crosshairs on it here. We go up in the brain to change the actual view. And you can see how it... Right, so if we put the crosshairs on a particular bit, it comes up in all the different views. So it really helps you get a 3D uh, picture. Okay. Remember to save it. So you can spend as much uh, time as you want on that if you enjoy it. Um, but at least I think for uh, a couple of structures, spend a bit of time uh, tracing out a, a volume of interest there. If you look on the um, feedback sheet, it gives you the answers, as it were, where all these areas are. Uh, so we've got the uh, core data and putainment I've just drawn out here. 
and the cerebellum as well I've already covered. Uh, the other ones you are asked to find here are the, the ventricles of the brain. So these are the fluid filled spaces in the uh, middle of the brain containing cerebrospinal uh, fluid. Um, and the main ones here, the lateral ventricles you can see in, in dark here, and they're just sort of spaces in the brain. They're not performing any processing function. Way back in the middle ages, they used to think that this was where the animal spirits and the psyche actually lived, but of course we now know that's not true. Uh, next on the list was the, uh, the hypothalamus. So this is really interesting to, uh, to look for. I'll close the um, BOI I've done there for the chordate. And the best way to find this is on the sagittal view here. Um, and we locate the thalamus, which is this big structure really in the middle of the brain. This is the thalamus is the brain's uh, relay station where all the sensory input is coming in and being sent out to different areas like the auditory cortex, the visual cortex for processing. The hypothalamus is underneath the, the thalamus here and we can see it on this view where the crosshairs are here. The hypothalamus here. Now you see this little thing sticking out from below hypothalamus. This is the pituitary gland, part of the pituitary gland stalk, but also the optic nerve is coming in here from the eyes and it crosses over at this point at the place called the optic chiasma. So there's pituitary gland, okay, releasing hormones into the bloodstream, communicating between the brain and the body, and that is integrally connected with the the hypothalamus, which controls release of hormones into the bloodstream. Uh, if I go to the axial view here, go down to the level of the eyeballs, you can follow the line of the optic nerve in through the frontal, underneath the frontal cortex there. This is actually the optic chiasma, where the optic nerves in the two eyes cross over. You can follow them through here. and. If I put the crosshairs on, you can see they're right there underneath the hypothalamus. Uh, uh, now, uh, the fact that the optic nerve is so uh, close there is uh, uh, interesting because one of the first signs of a pituitary gland tumour is actually a problem with vision in that you uh, will lose uh, peripheral vision because the tumour in the pituitary gland is pushing up on the optic uh, nerve. So quite an interesting fact to know. Okay, so next on the list, the basal ganglia, which is what we dealt with, the striatum, chordate, and uh, uh, putamen. That was the structure I was highlighting. The, the thalamus I've already covered as well. But what about this, the hippocampus, a very famous brain structure, not to be confused with the hypothalamus. Okay, quite a different place. And the hippocampus is really difficult to find. So this is involved in long-term memory formation. It's affected in the early stages of uh, Alzheimer's disease um, and is actually located in the uh, ventral part of the temporal lobe. That's the underneath and inner part of the uh, temporal lobes. So let's find the temporal lobes first. Here we go, we're in the temporal lobe here. This is the temporal lobe. We've got the parietal, occipital, frontal lobe. So the best way to find the hippocampus is on the, uh, the coronal view of the brain. And hippocampus means seahorse. Now you might wonder why it's called seahorse, because if you've ever seen a picture of it in the books when they've highlighted it on a picture of the brain, it doesn't look anything like a seahorse. Uh, but it does look like a seahorse when you look at it on the coronal slice view. So I'm scrolling forward in the brain now. Okay, so let's follow through the left temporal lobe here as we go back in the brain. Let's go a little bit further back and tucked inside in the ventral temporal lobe, we start to see this structure here. So it's a very evolutionarily ancient part of the cerebral cortex and we will consider it a subcortical 
uh, structure uh, separate to the rest of the cerebral cortex, but it's basically tucked inside uh, the temporal lobe here. And you can see that it has a bit of a squiggle shape, look at it over here, which you can imagine looking a little bit like uh, a seahorse. Okay, so I'm going to take a little break uh, now, but part two of the tutorial, we're going to come back and look at 3D rendering of the brain and also some patient scans, uh, which I think you'll find uh, interesting. So um, we'll just uh, see you in a couple of minutes. Hello, uh, welcome back to the second part of this neuroscience, neuropsychology, brain lab, practical online uh, tutorial seminar. And in this part, we'll be looking at the brain scan in 3D. So we can look at structures on the surface of the brain, uh, as opposed to the subcortical structures we were looking at in the first part. And also, uh, looking at uh, scans of patients that have had neurological injury and uh, are caused by different uh, reasons and um, seeing how that affects their, their brain scans. So uh, just before I move on to that, in the first part we were looking at subcortical structures and I noticed there's a structure here on the feedback sheet that I didn't talk about, the uh, amygdala, which is quite a famous structure in the brain is uh, known to be involved in emotional processing, rapid response to uh, fear-inducing stimuli, uh, for example. And I thought I'd just show you where that is in the brain before we uh, move on. Uh, so going back to MRI cron here, uh, if you look where the crosshairs are here, we're uh, in the tip of the temporal lobe of the cerebral cortex and if we make our way uh, back in the brain from the front here, so I'm scrolling through on the uh, coronal view, you'll start to see, not far from where uh, I highlighted the hippocampus, a bit further forward than that, uh, this dark blob here, which you can see is sort of part of the temporal lobe that's tucked underneath and inside the brain. But as with the hippocampus, it's an evolutionary ancient part of the cerebral cortex, uh, one of the first to develop uh, in evolution, and that is uh, what we call the amygdala, this dark uh, blob here on the left and the right. You can draw a, a volume of interest around it if you wish. I'm going to do it here. I'm not going to do it for every uh, slice, uh, but you can see it's a, if you chopped it out the brain it would have a sort of almond shape to it. So that's the amygdala. So now we're going to go on to, to look at the brain in 3D. The way we do that in MRI cron is we go to the window menu and we select uh, render and another uh, window pops up showing the brain rendered in 3D and we can move this around within this window using these controls at the top. Azimuth is the uh, position rotated horizontally and elevation tilts the brain up and down like this. But you can see there's a bit of a problem here because we can't actually see the frame. We can actually see the surface of the skin of the page, per person whose brain uh, this was which isn't very helpful for visualising 3D structures of the brain. But MRI Quan has a very clever facility which allows you to strip off the skin and the bone around uh, the brain and uh, render the surface of the brain. There's two ways you can do that. Go to Draw menu, pull down, and you find Advanced from that Draw menu option. Somewhere down the list here we've got, there we are, the second item, brain extraction. So you can extract the brain out of the skull and you simply click on this 
and another dialog box pops up and you press go. You just say uh, no to that if that message pops up. That's because I highlighted the amygdala there. And that will strip off the brain. However, there's a much easier way to do it. Just go to file, open, and if you navigate up from the MRI Pro directory where the um, original brain scan was, you'll see a file that says normal brain skull removed, and you can just open that. Okay, and you get the same thing. So then if you go back to view, uh, oh, so window, render, uh, you'll now get the view of the brain uh, rendered in 3D so you can see the surface of the cerebral cortex here. Now the exercises on the sheet are trying to get you to identify some key uh, structures on the surface of the brain and uh, you'll see all this wrinkly, crinkly stuff that we associate with the brain and the bumps in the brain are known as gyri and the grooves in between the gyri are known as sulci or individual sulcus and gyrus and although they look fairly random in the way they're uh, distributed across the surfaces of the brain in fact there is individual variation in the pattern of sulci and gyri that our brains have there seem to be some key uh, sulci and gyri that we can identify in majority of brains um, and some key landmarks here would be the sylvian fissure here which is dividing the temporal lobe of the cerebral cortex from the frontal and parietal lobe if I elevate the brain here you can see the big groove between the two cerebral hem hemispheres the central fissure, this is called, and of course we have two brains, two halves of the brain, which are connected by uh, a big fibre trap called the corpus callosum, which uh, you should be able to identify in the, the main scan, um, and uh, uh, the division between them is called the central fissure. I'll get to that cutout in a minute, uh, but I'll remove that out for the pur purposes of this description. So it's a bit fiddly this but uh, you'll get used to these controls at the top to spin the brain round. Just play so if you look at the bit. lateral surface of the brain here uh, you can identify a key landmark on the surface of the brain which is up, divides the frontal from the parietal lobe and this is the central sulcus. And I'll just uh, run my the crosshairs through on this now. You can see what's quite cool is it highlights it on the sectional view as you click on the rendered view there. So this is the central sulcus. And just forward of this, or anterior to this in the technical jargon, is the motor cortex. So this is the area where there is a map of the the body which relates to movement of the different limbs and parts of the body and there was a neurosurgeon called Wilder Penfield in America in the early part of the 20th century and he showed that when you electrically stimulated the surface of the brain in these regions you can elicit movement in uh, patients that he was operating on uh, depending on exactly where you were uh, stimulating. Now behind the central sulcus posterior to the central sulcus is the uh, postcentral gyrus, and here uh, you can actually uh, see a map of uh, a sen sensory map of the body, such that if you're electrically stimulating here, you would a patient would report feeling touch sensations or tickling in their feet, etc., uh, wherever uh, uh, Wilder Penfield was stimulating these sensations would be uh, elicited, elicited in different parts of the body. So there's another map here, a sensory map in the pre-central uh, gyrus. And the central uh, uh, sulcus here divides the parietal lobe on this side from the frontal 
lobe over here and of course you've got the occipital lobe at the back and the temporal lobes uh, here. So those are some of the key features on the surface of the cerebral cortex that you can uh, see. So the last part of this uh, brain lab practical is going to look at some brains that are actually uh, uh, damaged and uh, we uh, will be able to match the patients up to the little case study story they're going to show you in the uh, next part of the uh, video. Okay, welcome back. So now we're going to take a look at those patient scans that are in the MRI folder on the network. So if you go to MRI Cron and go to File, Open, put my glasses back on. Uh, let's start with patient one. Okay. Um, and uh, we can scroll around here on the, the scan. You can see it looks a bit different generally to the uh, normal brain scan we were looking at. The, the one we're exploring is, is kind of perfectly lined up in the frame. It's a really good quality scan. Often with these clinical scans, they're not quite as good, if not done on quite as good a, a MRI scanner, and the alignment on it was not done uh, quite so well. So that's why this looks a bit sort of wonky, uh, and the, uh, the contrast is, is slightly different. But there are other features that are clearly uh, different as well. And um, what I really try to do is say look for differences in symmetry in the scan between the left and the right half, but also between the front and the, the back. And we're looking for any obvious big holes that one might see in the, in the, in the, in the brain. Uh, some of these might be quite small but differences in the contrast or the, the image between one side or another might be indicative of a something something wrong. Now in this case with patient one, actually if we look where the crosses are now, uh, you can see there is a bit of a difference here right at the front of the brain and there's this black space here. And in fact, this was where this person suffered quite a nasty, uh, motorcycle accident injury uh, way back when he was very young. I think this guy was in his uh, 60s or 70s when this scan was taken, uh, but uh, you can still see the damage that was done to his brain when he had this Phineas Gage type accident whereby he was in, in his head was impaled on, a, on an iron railing when he came off his motorbike. But he survived healthy and well uh, uh, and no uh, obvious cognitive or, or emotional problems in, in his case, uh, but he still has this, this lesion on the front of his brain. And in fact, if you, if you really look closely and look, use your imagination, I think you can almost see the, the cross-sectional shape of the, the diamond shape of the, the iron, iron railing, which would have uh, gone through his head there. So quite a gruesome that, uh, one that, but that's uh, patient one. Patient two. Okay, uh, so again the general sort of 
shape of the brain looks different to the idealized scan we were looking at, but people's heads are different, different shapes and sizes. And in this case, what's happened is that the orientation of the scan has been done uh, uh, not uh, according to the standard orientation. You can see the person in the scanner has, has moved their head uh, quite a bit. But uh, that's okay as long as you're aware that these things can make a big difference to how the axial and the coronal slices look, so you have to be aware of that. But again, we're looking for differences left and right. I can already see here, you can see these black spots here in the subcortical areas. I think they're actually blood vessels, but uh, there's an unusually large amount of space around them. Um, but if we go higher up, I think we'll see something more pronounced, which is this area over here. And this is the, the scar or the area of damage that's been left by a a stroke. If we go to our uh, our, our sheet, um, worksheet, we've got the descriptions of the patients at the end here, and uh, in fact, this is patient B who suffered a stroke and was paralysed on the right side um, and in fact the way uh, scans are sometimes presented uh, particularly in a clinical uh, hospital concept is with the left and right flipped over this is for historical reasons because neurologists would hold up a scan image in front of a patient and they wanted the right of their image to be on the right side of the patient as they look from the end of the bed so in fact, this is a left-sided stroke here in the frontoparietal uh, region. So we'll look at it on the uh, other view. When we get to it, you can see it uh, here. And this is a very common type of injury arising from stroke. There's a big blood vessel called a middle cerebral artery, which supplies oxygen to the whole large area of the brain and uh, often this gets blocked and will lead to uh, this area of the brain being starved of blood supply and oxygen and the brain tissue in this area will die. So that is quite a small well-defined area of, of damage following a stroke. Often it can be much, much uh, larger in scale but also can be, can be smaller too. Okay, the last one I've got here is patient three. Okay, again, there's some problems with the arrangement of the scan here. Something's happened odd in the scanner here where the image is wrapped around. Uh, uh, so this actually should be over here. Something's got a bit corrupted in the, the file. Uh, so you have to lift these things. But um, uh, we can look at the brain by scrolling on the axial view or on the sagittal view here. Now there are asymmetries here you can see on the axial scan, the ventricles here. And in fact you've got to be aware that the whole scan here has been um, taken at a bit of an angle so I think that's what's causing those apparent asymmetries. Uh, but what I'm seeing here is the pattern of sulky and gyri being very, very pronounced and accentuated compared to what you'd see, for example, if we go back to our normal scan, um, our original normal scan, where they're very tightly packed uh, together. So as we get older, it's normal to see a bit more definition on the sulky and gyri as the brain tissue atrophies or, or shrinks a bit just as other parts of our body are sort of getting wrinkly and shrinky um, uh, but in this case this is not a normal amount of brain atrophy and I think if you can see if you look at the back of the brain here rather to the front so an asymmetry along the front and the, the back axis there's more of this going on in the front rather to the back so this is our uh, 
frontotemporal dementia patient that is described in the uh, worksheet where you've got localized uh, degeneration of brain uh, tissue in the frontal and temporal lobe which can lead to um, semantic type of dementia. Okay so I'm gonna leave you there and leave you to your own devices where you can actually have have, have some fun perhaps playing around with um, MRI cron you've got various different uh, color schemes you can uh, um, uh, create perhaps you want to email me um, pictures of uh, of images you created using MRI con you can save the output as an image file uh, uh, and print off pictures of brains and stick them on your uh, wall um, so feel free to to play around with it in whatever way uh, you would uh, you would like so I hope you've uh, got something out of that uh, found that interesting please feel free to email me uh, with the details will come up again in a minute if you have any uh, technical glitches in getting MRI uh, cron to run I'm more than happy to advise or help you otherwise um, thanks again to um, Chris Rawdon who invented MRI cron and makes it freely available to everybody uh, and uh, I will um, see you around see you.